For some people, when you start talking about prayer, it's like entering the world of magic. As if something really strange is going on here when we talk about prayer. There is an almost unassailable conviction that some pretty miraculous things are the direct result of some person's prayer. I have heard people attribute their survival to prayer while others around them perished. Apparently the direct result of their praying and others praying for them and some made it and some did not. I've known folks who believe that that if enough people are enlisted to pray about a certain outcome, then God, by the sheer weight of those prayers, will respond to that desire. Well, as a person who prays and who has an investment in prayer life, I'd like to talk with you about prayer this morning and learn what we can from our lesson from Luke's Gospel as Jesus taught his disciples about a particular prayer. If you read the Gospels, you'll find a lot of times in which Jesus is said to be praying, sometimes late at night, sometimes early in the morning, often off by himself whenever he could escape the crowds and the pressures of his ministry. And so it was natural for his disciples to say, well, gee, Jesus, you pray a lot. Uh, What is it that you pray about? And how do you do that? And are there some lessons that we could learn from you about how to pray? What makes a good prayer? And what follows is a very short version of the prayer we use on Sunday mornings called the Lord's Prayer. Just a a simple prayer with a doxology that was added later by the church as a, a formula to conclude the prayer. If you look in Matthew's Gospel in the sixth chapter, you'll find a slightly longer version of this prayer in Luke's Gospel and one that is really closer to the prayer that we use on Sundays. So, prayer school is now in session, and Jesus offers us this model for what a prayer could look like. Begins with the single word, Father. Father, testifying to an intimate relationship that not only Jesus has, but by inference, the disciples could have as well. It's a word of intimacy and belonging. Father, a testimony to whose we are, to whom we belong, to the family in which we occupy a very special place, to the God who says, welcome, you are part of my community. Father. What follows is, hallowed be your name, or may your name be honored. Hallowed be your name. For the Hebrew mindset, the name of God was so special it could not be spoken out loud. Could be represented by letters, but could not be spoken because to speak the name of God would be to control God, because naming something put dominion over that something. And since we cannot control God, we cannot use God's name. And so we find different ways of talking about this deity, but not using the formal name. So names are very important. They reflect and describe that person. And so in the prayer, it's holy is your name, for holiness means otherness. You are different from us. The father part speaks of a relationship, and the holiness says, you're way up there, and we're down here separating God from us in our own meagerness. We are in the family, Father, thank God, 
But God and God's goodness and righteousness is far beyond us even on our best moments, on our best days. There's this, this, this separateness. For we are creatures, we are not creator. Then is the phrase, your kingdom come, your realm come, or may your presence be evident in our lives and in the world in which we live. May the best that we have come to see in you, O God, be present in the lives that we live on this earth with these other fallible human beings that we bump into day by day and moment by moment. So in this prayer lesson, we begin with God, focusing on the inclusiveness of God, God parent, and the holiness of God, which surpasses our best efforts and whose will it is to infuse this world with God's presence. That's how the prayer starts. And then there are just three petitions, three simple petitions. First, give us each day our daily bread. Don't give us a year's worth, a career's worth. Give us enough to sustain us today, which means that we will daily be dependent upon God for the next day's gifts. Give us our daily bread enough to enjoy the life we have on this earth for the day that is this day. A very immediate, take care of us today. And then secondly, it says, forgive our sins and we will forgive the sins of others. See the connectedness? Forgive our sins and we will forgive the sins of others. Every time we pray this prayer, we acknowledge that we fall short of God's intentions, but God's forgiveness of us is connected to our willingness, our ability to forgive those around us, those people who keep bumping into us and making our lives a little less than pleasurable at times. But I wonder if we have prayed this prayer often enough that we miss that connection in the words that we speak. If you examine your life, you may find something for which God needs to forgive you. Look deep, you probably can find something. And then God's forgiveness is linked to your willingness to forgive others. Withholding our forgiveness of the other somehow puts God's forgiveness of us in jeopardy. Our inclination to hold grudges and to harbor old wounds compromises God's ability to just reach out and say, y'all, come on in. Because we haven't been able to say, y'all, come in to someone else. I trust that the words of this familiar memorized Lord's Prayer may not tumble off our tongues so easily that we miss this power of forgiveness, God to us, that then becomes our obligation to those around us. That's the second petition, forgive us our sins as we would forgive others. And then in, in Luke's uh, rendition, do not bring us to a time of trial. As Matthew would have us, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. In other words, God, don't tempt us. Life is tough enough. Don't see how much we can take. Don't play with us to see how loyal we could be if our backs were up against the wall. Don't play with us. We have this parable in the Old Testament, the book of Job, which talks about a conversation between God and some other entity. 
seeing how much Job can take. That's an Old Testament story. That's not the ministry of Jesus Christ. We make enough messes of our own lives that God is not responsible for our trials and our challenges. God, help us along. We're doing the best we can some of the times, maybe most of the times. Help us along. So this familiar prayer <clears throat> in its skeleton form talks about God's holiness and yet partnership with us and then offers these three simple petitions. Enough gifts to get us through this day. Enough for this day. Ability to forgive and to receive forgiveness, which is a two-way street both with God and with those around us. And the gift of mercy and grace and deliverance. That's what the prayer says. And then what follows is this parable that Jesus taught. <clears throat> it's a parable that I think has some challenges to it and can be misunderstood in my estimation. It's the story of a man who comes to his neighbor in the middle of the night and asks a favor. <clears throat> and the response is no response. Go away. Uh, I'm busy. I'm asleep. Uh, I don't want to do it. I don't want, I don't want to be inconvenienced. Don't bother me. But then this inconvenienced person responds, thinks better of it, has second thoughts, he doesn't do this out of neighborly love, but to get rid of the pest and the continuing interruption. There's a wrong lesson in this for me. It is to think that God can, in fact, be pestered enough to help you. That uh, first you need to overcome God's reluctance to be good, and then God will be good to you. It's as if God doesn't want to be helpful or good, so enlist as many other people as you possibly can, pray over and over again, pound on God's, God's door, wear God out, and maybe, just maybe, God will relent and do something godlike. Most of the parables that Jesus taught give us an insight into God's nature but there are a few parables, and I think this is one of them, in which the parable teaches us what God is not like. This householder in the parable is not the personification of God. God is not like the one who does a good thing just because God is peeved and wants to get back to sleep. Persistence may be a virtue, but God wills what is best for you and me because God is God. Not because you have pestered God to do something right and good. When we enlist others to pray for a loved one or for a cause or for ourselves, that will not determine God's grace or the outcome. When we enlist others to pray with us, what that does is knit us together in a common cause, one that will strengthen and comfort us in hope, and the blessing will be that we feel we have been a community of concern for a cause, for a person, for ourselves, in which we are the stronger for it because we have been a community. And so, friends, pray as if, as if, as if God were that wonderful, responsive parent who deeply loves every one of us and who always wills the best for us. You can count on that. And pray as if, as if the only worthy prayer we can pray always relies on God's grace and God's goodness and not on the eloquence of our words 
or the persistence of our efforts. Pray as if, as if your prayer never ends with a simple amen, but that prayer has knit you to God so that God can respond through you and others who are willing to be enlisted in God's work. Pray as if, as if you have taken seriously this connection between God's forgiveness and our willingness to forgive others. And therefore, we become most like God when we are able and willing to forgive, offering to them the grace that we always expect from God. Prayer is much more than giving God an update on what is happening in our lives, pointing out how God can be helpful in turning things around so that we will have life more easily lived. And prayer is more than giving God a to-do list to make our lives easier, more enjoyable, rewarding those who have been helpful to us and punishing those who have not. Prayer is more than asking for special favors, talking too much about ourselves in our own small universes. Every prayer we pray can be about us, certainly. But every prayer also needs to be about someone else needs to be someone besides us or in addition to us. And those others are not there to serve as convenient, lesser comparisons to our own virtues, but others who, in fact, do live on this earth with us and are as needful of God's help and sheltering love as we are. Those others are also God's children, God's loved ones as we are. And reaching out to them allows us to reach out to God, who is our creator, our savior, and our companion. But this God is also their creator and their savior and their companion. And Jesus concludes his prayer school in Luke's gospel this way. Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, <clears throat> knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Amen. Amen.